Hello, I'm Father Benedict Groeschel of the Franciscan Friars of the Renewal down in the South Bronx in New York. And we're continuing a series in this program called What to Do When Life Doesn't Make Sense. And today, we're going to turn our attention to that very familiar human phenomena when you're your own worst enemy. Most of us know that as tragedies or difficulties befall us in life, we have been participants in the disaster. The only people who don't seem to know that are people who are in jail or should be in jail. The rest of us seem to be quite well aware that when things do not go well, somehow or other, we have been participants in that or even caused it to happen. We've met the enemy and it is ourself. Now in this series, I've been very clear in my statement that when life does not make sense, the place to go is to the foot of the cross, to come before Jesus Christ our Lord and recognize that in Him we see the answer, not the complete answer for us, but the complete answer in eternity of the problem of evil and suffering. He, the Son of God, endures all of this suffering. In no way can we say that Jesus Christ was his own worst enemy. That does not apply. He is the Son of God, the eternal Word of God. When we are our own worst enemies, it's a result of the mysterious wound called original sin or our own sinfulness, or usually a combination of the two. You can't say that about Christ. And yet, from the analysis of other people, it would look like he was his own worst enemy. Just as St. Paul says, he became sin for us, he who was sinless, we can say that he appeared to be his own worst enemy. The great Danish religious writer and philosopher Søren Kierkegaard has a pa passage in his book, To Love God is to Will One Thing, in which he gives you a little vignette of a couple of scribes or Pharisees talking in Jerusalem at the time of the death of Christ, and one is saying to the other, well, you know, he was really quite gifted. It's just that he didn't know when to keep his mouth shut. And the other one said, well, yes, he was a, a bright young man and a, a good teacher, but, but he had no common sense. Don't you think that's what people said about Christ? Or worse, they would say that you could see disaster coming from the first day when he preached in the synagogue at Nazareth. You, you could see it coming. And he kept right on doing it, right toward the end of his life when he said the Son of Man must go up to Jerusalem and he will be mocked and scourged and spit upon and when they have mocked him they will put him to death. The apostles said, well, well let's not go to Jerusalem, let's go, let's go north, let's get out of here. And that's when he said, get behind me, Satan. You could say from a human point of view that because our Lord was pursuing a divine vocation, it looks like he was his own worst enemy. He really wasn't. But it has been said that the world hates two kinds of people. It hates the very good and the very bad, and it tries to kill them both. Now, for the rest of us, we have to say that when we think about ourselves, we've met the enemy and it's us. Let's take a look and some of the things that we might do in life that would make us our own worst enemy. Oh, and here I have to put on my psychological hat. See if some of this sounds familiar. Did you ever attempt to do something that you really know you can't do? Sometimes devout Christians do that. They say, well, the Lord will help me. I can do all things in Him who strengthens me. And I go right off the end of the dock. It's not because they've acted bad. Uh, badly is because they've acted foolishly. A wise man may attempt what is difficult. A fool will attempt 
what is impossible. And many, many foolish things that had nothing to do with God's will at all have been attempted in the history of the world. And they have, in the course of time, come to naught. Another way in which we are our own worst enemies is to think that we are doing God's will, unalloyed, perfectly. We have it all down, this is what God wants, I'm going to do it. And we mess it up because of our own self-will. That's a very, very common scenario, script, in Christian life. I've seen it lots of times, I've done it lots of times. I set out to try to do what seemed to be God's will, but I did it in my own way and with my own intentions. And I was quite convinced that, after all, this is what God wanted. I didn't take the time to match it up against either the teaching of sacred scripture or the teaching of the tradition of the saints or even the common sense of good people around me. And so it came to nothing. Another great way that we are our own worst enemies is that when we set about to do something good, we undo it by getting involved in jealousy and competitiveness so that the other people who are trying to do good with us, we suddenly become rather paranoid about. Many's a great cause and good cause when down the drain because of paranoia. Another way we're our own worst enemy is self-indulgence in things that are forbidden. And in our society today, there is such a tremendous amount of moral chaos, moral confusion, that it is very easy for a sincere person to be pulled off center by self-indulgence. In the headlines in the last few years, there have been several examples of people who were very well known, both Protestants and Catholics, who were doing very good things in the name of the gospel, but suddenly what they were doing was undone by their own sinful self-indulgence. They were caught unawares. In New York City, we have a courthouse, and across the street from the courthouse, a church was built, say, 40 or 50 years ago, the Church of St. Andrew. And in letters about five feet high, it says across the front of the Church of St. Andrew, carved in beautiful classical letters, Beati qui ambulant in lege domini. Blessed are they who walk according to the law of the Lord. Now, blessed means happy. It means fulfilled. It means, indeed, filled with blessing. And indeed, blessed are they who walk according to the law of the Lord. And unblessed are they that do not. And it's amazing, especially how sometimes people attempting to do something good for the kingdom of God get themselves all wrapped up in it and then they start to become self-indulgent. Another way that we typically are our own worst enemies is by resentment and hurt feelings. Resentment and hurt feelings can mess up, mess up a family. A young couple does their very best to raise a good family and some of the children, as they may, sow wild oats. Now, anybody who's read the Gospels, anybody who's read the history of the church knows that people who sow wild oats often come back and their sins in the past provide the rocket fuel for a better Christian life. You just have to wait and see. There's people like St. Augustine, St. Mary of Egypt, St. Margaret of Cortona, they all had wild lives and they all became very devout and sincere converts. Many is a person who's watching this program right now at some time or another, dropped out of religion, dropped out of their faith, and got back and perhaps was better for it all because they were sincerely repentant. But a parent or someone else who loves someone sees this happening and they can't wait. <laughs>
and they become bitter and resentful. In the course of my life, I worked with a few young people who became priests or religious and who in these years of confusion dropped out. Some of them made complete about faces. They gave up the whole thing. You know what I do? I pray for them all the time. Oh, I have to fight off bitterness and resentment. Yes, I do. And I have to fight it off especially when they say things against what they once thought were holy and good things. But prayer, and even my sufferings for them, I offer up as a prayer. Among my friends in the past was a remarkable and great Christian, Frank Sheed. Frank, I think, was a saint. He published thousands of religious books, different titles. He and his wife, Sheed and Ward. And one time a friend of mine wrote to Frank and she complained about how her children were doing, how they seemed not to be the Christians that she had hoped them to be. And Frank wrote back and he said, take your tears and sufferings and offer them up to God for your children because you can't do much with them, but God can do a lot with those tears and sufferings. If you're one of those fair weather Christians who thinks that everything is going to work out beautifully, well, you, you, you better learn you better, because you won't know what to do when life doesn't make any sense. Then there is also the self-destruction that comes uh, from using the things of God for one's own self-interest. And that kind of self-destruction is often spoken of in sacred scripture. Oh, in the New Testament, in the Acts, we have Ananias and Sapphira. We have even the apostles hoping to get something out of being apostles. We've given up all things. What are we going to get out of all of this? And the sons of Zebedee, they wanted to sit in the first place in the kingdom of God. And our Lord had no time for this. He told them kindly and very directly that this was not what they should be thinking about. There is in sacred scripture a very interesting example of a man who certainly got involved in self-indulgence and in doing self-destructive things, and yet he was a man to whom God had given immense blessings. He's one of the most enigmatic figures in sacred scripture. He is both a saint and a sinner. And that is King David. As you know, David was chosen as a boy to be the leader of Israel by the prophet Samuel. You know that the Lord saved him when King Saul attempted to kill him. You know that he went through dim and dark times that his own son turned against him and that he wept for his son, Absalom, when Absalom was killed in the course of trying to defeat his own father. And then there comes a remarkable event. It's one of the strangest events in the Bible. It's very touching. It's about King David. King David was walking along and uh, he said, uh, uh, you know, that he, um, uh, he was a sinner. He acknowledged it. Uh, uh, and there was this man named Shemi, or Shimi. And this is in the book of Samuel. And Shimi cursed King David. He was wicked to him. The king was walking along with his soldiers, uh, King David, and Shimei got up on the side of the hill and he threw dirt bombs and rocks down on David and said, you wicked and evil man, you terrible man, you hurt the house of Saul and now you are going to be defeated yourself. And he was throwing things at him and the, the soldiers wanted to go up and just dispatch Shimei right at the moment. And uh, 
Abishai wanted to say, wanted to go up and cut his head off. And David said, no. What if the Lord makes him speak this way? Shall, shall, I, shall I not listen? Maybe it is God that makes him speak to me this way. And so David accepted complete humiliation. Instead of seeing himself as someone who had brought the world in on top of himself, King David accepted the condemnation and it brought him out of his sinfulness. Think of the two powerful examples in the New Testament, Peter and Judas. I suspect that all of the apostles had resentments against Jesus. You say, oh, they couldn't have been resentful against Jesus. Haven't you ever been resentful against God? They lived with Jesus. They did not quite know who he was as his public life was going on. They were astonished when he rose from the dead. They knew that he was a prophet. They, St. Peter said he was the Holy One of God, uh, the Messiah, greater than all the prophets. But they didn't know quite the whole story. But you know, he was a disappointing Messiah. They wanted to go down into Jerusalem and have him work miracles all over the place, turn the doors of the temple to gold and turn the weapons of the Roman soldiers to butter. They, they were in for great times. What did our Lord do? He stayed in Galilee, in the boondocks. Who did he go around healing? Lepers, outcasts, pagans, crazy people living up in the tombs. They wanted to go down to Jerusalem. Let's, let's capitalize on this whole thing. Let's, let's do something with this. <laughs> Nothing. Nothing happened. And so they were resentful. And one of them became terribly, terribly resentful, perhaps because of his own greed, perhaps because he was dis displeased with continuing to be an outcast. He thought he was going to be one of the top bananas in Jerusalem, if we can use that expression. That was Judas. Another one of them was resentful because he was constantly failing and constantly being reproached by Christ, and that was Peter. And so these two men had to go on, and uh, after the Passion, each one had to handle his own problems, his own difficulties, and they failed or succeeded. Judas failed. He fell right down on his face. And he missed one of the great opportunities in all Christian history. I've said it before, that if Judas had repented, in every big city in the world there would be a church dedicated to St. Judas the Penitent. If Judas had knelt at the foot of the cross and gone out and perhaps been the bravest of the apostles, he would have presented the world to a marvelous, uh, the world with a marvelous example of a man who messed everything up, ruined everything for himself, and then by repentance undid the damage. Instead, the person who does this is Peter. Peter, the head of the apostles. Peter fails, but he humbly accepts his punishment, and, and it's given to him in a very, very interesting way. After Christ rises from the dead, he says to Peter, do you love me? Do you love me more than these other ones? And in English, we can't bring it out too well, but in the Greek, it comes out rather interestingly. He really says in Greek, do you love me like a friend? Using the Greek word for friendship, philia. And then he uses the Greek word agapo. Do you love me when there is no reward for loving me? Do you love me just for the sake of loving me? Feed my sheep. It's very, very beautiful because Peter is then called 
Perhaps he doesn't achieve it, but he's called to loving Christ for no return at all. That mysterious kind of love which is called in the gospel agape. I love you when I don't get anything out of it at all. That kind of love undoes all the things that we have in life that we've messed up because we're our own worst enemies. We were seeking ourselves. St. Augustine gives a beautiful example. He wants to tell us how Christ loved the church. And so he takes an example of a husband and wife. And one of them, let's say the husband, has been stricken by a stroke or what we would perhaps call senility or Alzheimer's disease and can't respond at all. And the other spouse who has loved this person all during life when they could respond now continues a loving service when there is no response at all. That's agape. That's the love that undoes all the evil in the world. Now, you know that we set ourselves up for failure, for frustration, for disaster in various ways. Sometimes we're doing good, sometimes we're doing bad. Please don't think that people go through life uh, who are trying to do good and everything just works out beautifully. It doesn't. Oh, I remember the day very well. It was one of those agape days. It was about two days before Christmas, and I was working at Children's Village, for home for boys with problems, and I left Mass in the morning, and I was driving down the road, and I saw this dog stuck in a snowbank. So I got out to pull this little dog out. It was a long-haired dachshund, and the dog clamped onto my wrist. The blood was flowing down my arm, and I finally shook the dog off inside my station wagon truck, and he sat there on the seat looking terrified of me. I said, well, now I've got to go to the doctor, and I've got to take the dog to someplace. So I drove down with the dog staring at me, got to the hospital. The doctor bound up my arm. He says, it was a German doctor. He says, now we must put the dog in the pound, because if the dog dies in the next two weeks, you've got to get the rabbi shots. And if you die in the next two weeks, the dog got to get the rabbi shots. So then I took the dog to the pound. The dog got so frightened, he got sick all over the seat of the car. I brought the dog into the pound. It was the wrong pound. They had to put him in another pound. My head was throbbing from the tetanus shot, and I had promised to take the boys to the Christmas pageant at the local college, which was the worst Christmas pageant I ever saw in my whole life. And as I was leaving, one of the sisters said, oh, would you drive this other young fellow home to Yonkers? He missed the bus. And I said, fine. Drove the boys back to the village, drove this boy home, was driving back, and my truck ran out of gas. So I walked a half mile to a phone booth, dropped the money in, and the phone booth was broken. I began to panic, and I was so pleased that a police car came out and was searching around the neighborhood for an oddly dressed man who was seen prowling through the neighborhood. That was me. The policeman drove me 15 miles to an all-night gas station. I finally got home, and I had left a beautiful wood carving crucifix on the piano for the lady on the radio for the lady who was our volunteer organist and a little pinafore for a lady who got paid for tidying up my rooms once a week. And I found a note from the lady who cleaned up the rooms, thank you so much for the beautiful wood carving crucifix. Now I didn't have a present for the choir director. I got into bed, put out the light, and my bed fell down. I couldn't believe it. In fact, I stayed all night on the bed on the floor. I was afraid if I stood up, I'd break my leg. How do you survive this? I don't know what it's called. There must be some time that statistically, everything works out badly even when you're doing your best. What do you do? You go on. You accept some of life, do the best with the rest, and recognize that the Lord uses it to teach you something. St. Augustine is one of my great friends. You probably know that if you watched me before. 
And he says, you know, we never like to admit that we need some correction. Most of the time when we're our own worst enemies, we fail to admit that we've done something wrong. St. Augustine says in a sermon, men are hopeless creatures, and the less they concentrate on their own sins, the more interested they become in the sins of everybody else. They seek to criticize, not to correct, and unable to excuse themselves, they are all too ready to excuse other people. He says, this is not what King David shows us. He shows us in his psalm, my sin is always before me. He concentrated on his sins. And he says to God, create a clean heart in me, O God. And Augustine says, the only way that God can do this is if we have a broken heart. Augustine says we should be displeased with ourselves when we commit a sin, for sin is displeasing to God. And sinful that we are, he says, let us be like God in at least this, that what is displeasing to him is displeasing to us. If we accept our own role as poor sinners and pray with trust and joy, we can't be our own worst enemies for good. Thank you.